Hello. My name is Betsy Johnson, and I'm an assistant curator here at the Smithsonian's Hirschhorn Museum and Sculpture Garden in Washington, D.C. I want to thank you all for joining us tonight to celebrate the publication of Tony Lewis Anthology 2014 to 2016, this book right here, um, which is the first book in a new series of texts dedicated to works in the Hirschhorn's permanent collection. This book is very dear to my heart as it is dedicated to the first body of work that I curated at the Hirschhorn, um, which was a series of 34 collage poems by Chicago-based artist Tony Lewis. Lewis describes his practice as an ever expanding engagement with drawing that harnesses the medium of graphite powder to confront social and political topics such as race, power, communication, and labor. His work has been subject, the subject of museum exhibitions at the Aspen Art Museum in Colorado, the Institute of Contemporary Art in Philadelphia, Modern Institute, Glasgow, the Museo Marino Marini in Florence, the Museum of Contemporary Art in Chicago, the Studio Museum Harlem, the Whitney Museum of Art in New York, and of course, the Smithsonian's Hirschhorn Museum and Sculpture Garden, where we were thrilled to show his work in 2018. In addition to writings by myself and Tony, the book includes con contributions by Theaster Gates and Carl Hendel, both highly respected artists who have been longtime friends and supporters of Tony's work. So without further ado, I am uh, thrilled to welcome Tony to turn his camera on and join me in conversation about um, this very powerful body of work. All right, Bessie. <laughs> How are you doing? <laughs> I'm doing great. Thank you for that um, lovely introduction. Yes, you're so welcome. It's always a pleasure. Uh, so we first worked together back in 2018. Um, and I think we have some slides here. So if we could bring those up. Um, the first one, of course, is this book. Um, but it shows on the next page, um, or the kind of the to the side, the body, one of the works from um, this series anthology 2014 to 2016 that we had on view at the Hirschhorn. And they're all rather small in scale. Um, these are tiny works for you. Sometimes you work quite large, but these ones are on the smaller side. Um, so oh. if we flip to the next slide, we can see an installation view from the Hirschhorn. It kind of takes me back to seeing this work in this space. Um, it was such a beautiful kind of minimal installation. I loved that for it in this white room. Um, and these, uh, some of the works are kind of black and white, like we just saw. Some you've actually kind of completely obscured with um, with the, the tape, <laughs> with the, what do you yeah. call it? <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. It's um, called correction tape. For, it's correction like, it's tape, like branded yes. white out or something else. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So it's more kind of white on white. Um, but this is a rather unique body of work for you. Um, and it was a way, you know, you've always been engaged with drawing and with acts of erasure um, and thinking about drawing more broadly, especially through the use of graphite. Um, but this body of work like I said, usually often you were quite large. This body of work is quite small so um, and quite personal. So I thought perhaps we could start um, by you telling us exactly where it came from and kind of what you were thinking of when it came about, where you were at in, in, in life as this was unfolding, this body of work began. Yeah, absolutely. So I think, uh... You're right to say that at the time when I was working on this, when I started this body of work, I was kind of in the throes of working on large scale drawing. Um, I was kind of um, interested in, you know, large sheets of paper, uh, an, ex in a, uh, an extremely messy studio, basically everything covered in graphite powder. And that became a way for me to run a studio and um, from a conceptual standpoint, physical standpoint, and visually, obviously, that space influenced how the work looked. So I was in that mindset. And uh, I think around the time when I started working on, on these collages or work that these collages came out of, I think it became, it was a result of uh, a, a space shift. It was a studio move. And uh, the studio move was from actually 2013 from graduate school 
to a very small basement uh, studio that was about 200, maybe actually smaller than about 150, 115 square feet, actually. It was actually rented as a writing studio in the basement of a Greystone on the north side of Chicago. And um, so once I made that shift, I had all this stuff and all this material and I had to put it in a really tight, compact space. And uh, I made it work. I, it took me a minute to get, to get acclimated to that sort of environment. But one of the things that came out of it, I think, was a desire to work on small things just because of space sort of limitations. Because, you know, um, at, up until that point, I, I'd worked on drawings that are, you know, six feet tall, seven feet tall. And I also have these things called floor drawings, which can sometimes be anywhere between 100 square feet, 200 to 1,000 to 3,000 square feet. These massive pieces of paper, which is an entirely different project. So in my brain, I'm thinking, okay, I got this really big object called a floor drawing that does certain things with drawing that say my large six foot by seven foot drawings that are like the size of my body, you know, th both of those drawing projects do different things and they kind of balance each other out. But I realized I've always made small drawings. I've always sort of worked, um, I actually started out drawing like most people in a school notebook and those are tiny little doodles. So that kind of way of thinking about making a drawing kind of came about when I was in a smaller space. And um, I think it's hard to explain when and how exactly uh, my, the book, uh, the Calvin and Hobbes authoritative book came into the studio. I think it was something I was hanging on for a while because I did that for a while. I, hung, I sort of um, hung around. I, I had a few books that have been around me all my life. I always have them around. And uh, when the studio shifted, when it got messy, those books got messy. And so one of those books was this Calvin and Hobbes book, which again, is something that I don't want to get too much into why it's there and what it means to me right now, because I think we'll get to that later. Mm -hmm. But for the purposes of right now, that, that book ended up being something that I was able to kind of get into, started to open up and start to look at. Um, we go to the next of, slide, I think. We do have this. <laughs> right. So that, that's an image from it's now a loose leaf page, but it was a page that existed inside of the authoritative of Calvin Hobbes, which is a gift from my dad, as you can see back in 2001, um, for, getting a 90, for getting a good grade on a, on a history exam, actually. And um, so that has a tremendous amount of meaning. And, um, but so that book that this comes from ended up bec becoming the, uh, the catalyst for working with uh, Calvin and Hobbes pretty intensely where I'm going through and I'm kind of kind of cutting and I'm kind of um, selecting, pulling out. And when I'm doing that, I'm also drawing on the surface and drawing on the surface. I talk about this a little bit in the essay, but it basically got me to a place where there was this uh, connection between uh, history uh, in my life uh, connected to a contemporary way of working and thinking about art making. And so that kind of convergence happened when I started working on Calvin Hobbes directly with pencil. Well, and what I think, uh, one thing that I notice here is exactly what you were talking about before that, that your use of loose graphite in the studio means that graphite ends up on everything. You know, there is this quality to graphite that you embrace and especially in its loose form where um, where it travels <laughs> and it's really kind of hard yeah. to contain. And we can yeah. see that on, this is like a sort of palimpsest already kind of on this title page that was signed by your father. Um, and so, uh, that this is this quality of being a palimpsest of all of these marks of your fingers of the handling of kind of the wear over the years this is something that um, is a sort of through line through your work I would say you um, you almost 
always or very regularly choose to work on pages that have already been kind of roughed up in some way that are that already kind of show the effects of time. And so I think um, having this in your studio and having this very precious book then that you've carried around that your father had given gifted to you that um, that you really explored and delved into the universe of and then it's it's kind of already shown all of these layers and everything's building up on it for you to then start tearing apart this book essentially and using it which in in some ways feels like a very violent act to a very precious object right um but it's then but but it it is so much a kind of in keeping with the way you think of materials in your practice and especially foundational materials like starting points, right? A hundred percent. I think the only reason why I was able to do it is because in my brain, at least not historically, but as an object in the studio, it registered as paper. Mm -hmm. And it registered, uh, you know, as something that I could make a mark on. And if I didn't have that, if I didn't have that logic or if I didn't have that rule, I don't think I would have been able to do it. But understanding it as paper gave it a value uh, that sort of reinvigorated its purpose. It's no longer a historical thing that I keep as an artifact. It's now um, something that itself has a tension built, built in, a little bit of history, but also uh, the potential for for uh, making like making art, so that shifted its meaning and its uh, just like physical potential in the studio. And I think let's um I feel like we jumped right in and this part yeah. of my fault, but maybe we <laughs> should kind of reel back a little for some people who don't know we've the been work as about well as we do. We've been yeah, involved we, in this for yeah. years now, this conversation. <laughs> but um, no. but let's move to the next slide. Um, this is so this project is um it ended up right. having very specific stages to it. Um, and I described it as a collage poem, but really the final product were poems in in your kind of estimation, but we can get there. But so so there are these stages of working that um, where you actually used drawing as a means of writing, ultimately writing poetry. Um, and so I thought maybe we could work through what those stages are a little bit and how that came about and what the sort of meaning is of that. We can start to pick it apart, but what are we looking at right here? Yeah, so what we're looking at now is uh one of my old drawing boards, which is covered with uh, several very small drawings. All of these little teeny drawings were pulled from uh, Calvin and Hobbes, uh, or, or pull, yeah, were pulled from Calvin and Hobbes pages. And once they were pulled, and once they were cut and sort of, um, you know, individualized, like creating a little individualized cell or a square, or you see a circle there, um, it then became something I could draw on. It then became something that I could manipulate. So I think I first started making different types of, uh, of drawings on the page, but after a while, and, you know, I did this for a while and there's a lot of drawings that exist. This is a way for me to make a drawing um, that still is around, that I still do to this day. And out of that, out of basically applying in this particular use, basically each one of these small drawings has graphite pencil, 9D, um, sort of drawn on the actual surface around the speech bubble. And the speech bubble is edited with that correction tape, which is basically whiteout. So the whiteout acted as a way for me to manipulate the text inside the speech bubble. And the pencil allowed for, basically allowed me to make a shiny, uh, graphite monochrome drawing. And when I was able to do that, I mean, I like, I liked what happened there. I like already what happened, you know, conceptually going from the source material to its own individual drawing, but then also having these really weird um, language moments. Some of them are isolated words and some of them are, and this is actually, this video is a great, great uh, example of that. So I'd cut it out and I'd attack it the same way I'd attack this. Should we let this play or should I not say anything? I think we can talk a little bit while it's playing. 
it's a lengthy <laughs> video. I don't know if we'll end up watching the whole thing, but I thought it's kind of nice to see you making one of these small drawings and people can yeah. really kind of get a sense of what this initial step of the process was. You know, you, you, right. um, you cut out, um, the, the square from the comic and then you start kind of erasing words. And so it, in, in some ways, did it always start with the language? Is that where it always began? I don't think so. I think it started with, it always started with the paper, you know, and a lot of times it started with the image. But what we're looking at, or at least the way that, um, that turned into this particular body of work we're discussing, it became about pencil monochromes. It, beca it, it became about, you know, squares. It became about black squares, graphite squares. Like I was thinking more about um, like Richard Serra and, I was, and, and his, or, or historically I'm thinking about Malevich. I'm thinking about the history of the black square and what that and how that functions in drawing and how it functions and what that means when you try to when you when you sort of converge that with you know um a beloved comic strip and also the speech bubbles ended up adding this weird sort of layer because sometimes the language i found language that stood out i found words that sort of jumped out at me and sometimes i found them in combining letters and sometimes they were just there alone but I ended up wanting to keep them because they were saying something. And then they basically gave me a way to understand this is another way of making a small text drawing, which kind of refers back to other works I've made, which are also text-based. So it's definitely a way to think about another way of understanding uh, what, uh, for a lack of a better term, what voice might be, what language might be in artwork. And, uh, you know the way, whether whether the language is appropriated or whether it's mine was a question here and especially through the editing process so being able to think of them as text drawings think of them as as monochromes and think of them as you know these things that were kind of uh all based in calvin hobbs was all was all interesting to me and it's actually very weird for me to watch this video <laughs> because this is just what i'm doing <laughs> and this is just how it goes. It's actually very embarrassing. But um, yeah, I think so. The creation of this type of work was about was about uh, getting to, I think, some sort of um, uh, specific idea of um, of graphite, uh, but conceptually, not just uh, sort of like being able to switch the language or the thought process of like the black square or the black space and start thinking of it in terms of graphite space or draw a space in drawing where it was sort of like a bit of an abyss. And I like the idea that I could take something that was as grand as an abyss and put it in a tiny little square. And so that's how those, that, that's how they ended up becoming um, monochromes. And so then they ended up being, and then obviously if you've got, if you go back to the other video or picture, you don't have to, but that other picture shows hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of these small little abyss drawings, um, monochrome drawings, graphite, black squares, whatever you want to call them. There's hundreds of those. And when you sit them next to each other, you start seeing these visual patterns between the drawings. And you also start seeing linguistic patterns. You start seeing words next to other words. And uh, some of those little things that were kind of happening next to each other, they look, at least to me, they almost look like a random, like, mind synapsis, where you'd see an idea next to a thing, and it was the first time I had ever heard a thing like that. First time I'd ever thought about this word next to this word. And that, to me, was very weird, because it got me thinking about language organization and writing got me thinking about the sequence of drawings next to each other, creating a triptych or a diptych or what happens when I place four or six in a row next to each other and I create a long sentence. So things started to get weird around that time. Well, and that's so, so you didn't necessarily embark on the drawings thinking that you were going to combine them. It was something that came later. They were all individual works, yeah. And they still are, with the exception of the collage poems, yeah. Yeah, and I mean, it's interesting to me, I think when you when you talk about this 
work as each one of these little drawings as something akin to a Malievich or a Richard Serra, perhaps. I mean, you're really talking about the language of abstraction here, yeah. right? And and yeah. it's interesting that you're using um, words in and you're you're placing text within that language of abstraction, um, and um, and then and then finding your way back to meaning as you have, as you've kind of abstracted these words out and then as they start to appear next to one another um, and you see the juxtapositions between these sorts of abstract units, um, there's there's meaning that kind of starts filtering back in. And if we can go, I think to the, to the slide after the video, we can see one of these completed, there you go, um, completed works. And so on the left here, you have a completed collage poem. And then on the right, you have the, um, the actual poem that you then pulled from this collage, right? Yes. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, when did you decide upon adopting the Sunday comic format for these collages? I think that's a great question. and I I think the, the adoption of that format um, happened when I needed a kind. I needed a a structure. I needed a format to think about uh, putting these together. Because if I didn't have that format, then the it would have just been a never-ending epic poem, which would have been. It's something I do, but I think when I first wanted to try to understand what this was, I wanted to basically present it as something that I could understand because even at this stage, I did, I'm sure how these are gonna end up. Um, so, it, and also the other thing that made it, that solidified that decision, I think was the actual text itself, the language that was coming out, the relationships between the drawings were, was, was sort of naturally coming out and there's a bit of a cadence and uh, there was a bit of a cadence of meaning and a rhythm of writing that felt um, pretty uh, unique and uh, uh, pretty, uh, at least novel in my brain. So I think the, the, the format allowed me to sort of get to meaning pretty quickly and precisely but also it allowed me to, I think, harken back to the, to, to the format of, of uh, where it comes from. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Um, I think, you know, one of the things too is this wasn't necessarily the first time you used language in your work. Um, and, and you have spoken right. before and you do, I think, um, or at least I mentioned, I maybe mentioned in the book that one of the early language works that you were very familiar with, I think we have on the next slide, was something that um, that initially had kind of, you know, made you upset. <laughs> you weren't necessarily fully on board with this work when you first um, encountered it at the Art Institute when you were a student in Chicago there at the Art Institute of Chicago. Um, and, you know, I think, you know, one, this is, this is by the conceptual artist, Lawrence Wiener. It is a site specific yeah. work. Uh, Lawrence Wiener is known for placing language in, um, in, you know, often in situations where it's kind of referring to the situation perhaps, or it could be referring to the situation that you're standing in, or there is something about location, the location or um, in, the, in the linguistic piece itself. But these are conceptual works that are not necessarily meant to be uh, fixed in meaning, right? <laughs> and there is an ambiguity yeah. here. There's something maybe hard to grasp here. It's meant to be kind of just out of your grasp all the time, like you're scrambling to try to understand what um, what this means in the context of where you're seeing it. So this one, of course, is taken from here to where it came from and taken to a place and used in such a manner that it can only remain a representation of what it was, where it came from. So I don't know if you want yeah. to explain a little <laughs> bit of some of your 
your initial thoughts on language and art and how you came uh, about around to the idea of actually using words in your drawings. Wow. Well, that's a, it's a much question. <laughs> larger question <laughs> than I think I was prepared to, uh, to answer. But uh, I think it's a great question. And I think uh, Lauren Sweener, his whole body of work, I mean, when you, it's like, I, I'll spend, I am still learning personally about Lauren Sweener and, uh, and, and artists of that particular caliber who have such expansive careers. Um, so it's, I think what's so compelling to me is that uh, from the beginning, the first time I had seen say text, or language, however one might talk about it, in art, uh, it was sort of an unfounded, ridiculous thing. And it was a bit of a confounding thing. And it still functions that way. And I think if it ever stops functioning that way, then I probably won't be interested. Um, so I think in a lot of ways, it's been something that I can learn from and it's something that I can, that helps me uh, I think understand my relationship to art in a weird way. Maybe I can rephrase that. My relationship to art, I understand it better through language, uh, writing and speaking. And so understanding or being able to understand the sort of performance of language or the usefulness uh, uh, or the sort of material kind of um, utility of language and art making um, opens up a whole world of possibility when you're talking about making, when you're talking about producing artwork. And so for me, um, it, there's always going to be a question. And to this piece, there's always going to be something that's a little bit weird and a little bit confusing. And there's always going to be something that uh, makes me second guess, reread. Uh, I think it took me a few tries of dealing with this particular work at the Art Institute before I decided to read it backwards. And reading it backwards didn't really give me anywhere closer to understanding it, but it was a fun experience. And I like that. You know what I mean? Yeah, and I think that that in some ways um, sets the stage for some of the later work you do where, where it's more about kind of pulling apart language and understanding words less for their symbolic meaning, for their signification and more for maybe a sort of different interaction you can have with language as almost a sculptural entity, right? That you can move around and through and you can rearrange and you can have more playful pathways. Yeah. through. Um, and we do see that um, in some of your later work. Um, I think if we go forward, maybe two slides, we see that here, this, um, this series that you did. Um, I think this began in 2010, if I am correct. Yes. Um, and it's got, it's a series with a very, very long title. <laughs> 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 um, the series, it's untitled. Um, oh, where did I put the title? Let me see. I wrote it down earlier and now I've lost it. Um, here it is. Uh, people of color, peopled color, and the color of people colored people is yeah. the text that you used. And this is a text of your own creation that you right. used, that you would put across um, the, the page selectively. So you would kind of already excise some of the language and then you would use a pencil line to kind of redirect the reading pathway through the through the text so here we have people you have the line coming from the left going cutting across people and then dropping down through the ad from and and then cutting up and going backwards through <laughs> color and of and then dropping down through oh so this is almost exactly what you're what you just described in terms of, you know, kind of trying yeah. to read the text backwards from the Lawrence Freener work here, you're kind of playing with this idea um, in a different kind of way with, with text of your own creation. Yeah, I think there was a moment, you know, absolutely trying to understand the usefulness and the utility and materiality of what's happening here. And also in these drawings in particular, compositionally in terms of uh, you, it, there's, these are very, 
I, I, I tend to talk about these almost as, as tight as um, engineering drawing uh, because, uh, you know, they are uh, hand drawn and they're sort of um, the way that you would, I mean, the, I know, ex for example, the position of the P in this drawing, I know for, for a fact, because ever since because the whole, whole series, it is 10 inches from the top of the page and seven inches from the left side of the page in, and that's the top point of the letter P and the top, the capital P. And that thickness there is 11 sixteenths of an inch. And so, and I know that because I've drawn so many of them, but it's such a tight process. So everything is really mapped out really tightly on this piece of paper, which just speaks to the specificity of the language in relationship to this size paper and all of those things. But what happens when you have this sort of base text, when you have the word people of color, and in this case, when you read it normally, you know, and if you read it quickly, it says people of Colorado. But at the same time, the fact that the drawing to me, because of the line sort of helps to redirect, it creates a world where, you know, the title of the work is people add roll lock foo. And people add roll lock foo is weird, but it is still the same thing. And a lot of times, you know, this was an earlier, this is a drawing early on in the process where it was thinking about those two ideas, those two phrases at the same time in relationship to, uh, you know, what was absent, but also understanding, you know, the power of, uh, of uh, line and redirection and rereading, but also uh, I think the whimsy and the sort of delicacy of the line that cuts through and creates that sort of pathway is also something that I think was, was meant to sort of create a, I think a pretty open, but also very specific video. Um, yeah, and I think if we go back one slide, uh, just to show this work, you know, there are some other historical precedents also for sort of using language yeah. in um, a more rhythmic kind of sculptural way, not necessarily kind of like divorcing it a little bit from meaning, the meaning might still be there, but we have Hugo Ball's Caruana uh, from 1917, which is really just thinking about um, rhythms and the way uh, language and words uh, or nonsense trips off of your tongue as a way to create a poem. And I think that, you know, in some ways um, is an interesting kind of foil to some of your poems uh, where there is a little bit more meaning created, but you're still thinking about language in a sort of sculptural and rhythmic way. Um, yeah. If you go forward, maybe two slides, I think past the one we were just looking at, um, we can see some of the other ways you've used language in your work before. Um, this, of course, being from the Life's Little Instruction Book uh, by H. Jackson Brown Jr. on the wall here behind this floor drawing, which you were talking about earlier. These are your amazing yes. sculptural floor drawings that take up real yeah. space. Um, this one's taking up space in the room here, but behind it on the wall, you have um, you have a, a phrase that you have taken in a fight. Mm -hmm. Uh, hit first and hit hard from these little instruction books that um, that people often have lying around their homes. Uh, right. that was H. Jackson Brown's uh, Brown Jr.'s attempts to kind of give his son uh, guidance as he went off to college. You know these these right. things. But yes. but you do you know so you have often chosen to work with language that is meaningful to you in some way but then kind of extrapolate yeah. it or challenge it. You know, it might be complicated language. It could be of your own making. It could be language that you found in a book elsewhere. Um, uh, and so this is kind of part of your series, but I guess when we think about the Calvin and Hobbes language, um, and if we go to the next slide, I think, um, there is a sort of layer of personal history that you are addressing in this work. Um, you know, the Calvin and Hobbes being a story that you were very invested in as a child. Um, and you can go into this in this book, in this lovely yeah. letter that you write to the Calvin and Hobbes creator, Bill Watterson. Um, but, but it's interesting to me that 
you know, by the time you have finished working with the language of Calvin and Hobbes, it's really, you know, there's something about it that you've described as a process of making the language your own um, and kind of taking the original voice, like, so taking the voice of Calvin out of it, taking the voice of Hobbes out of it, taking Bill Watterson out of it. And there is like in this process of making a drawing and then assembling those drawings into a collage and then turning that collage into a poem, it's a way of working with this um, perhaps uh, very heavy or, or like uh, personal text, but then, um, but text that came from somebody else and really making it even more yours, right? Yeah, I think that's sort of when the, when the project itself became, uh, I, when it started to, I, you know, for lack of a better term, when it first started to reveal itself in terms of what it could do, like what the end game was, that's when I started realizing, oh, wait a minute. I think the end result here of this, of this way of working has got to be a uh, free language. And there's no, because I don't really have a format or I don't, I don't really have a, a, a thing to call it once I'm finished or once it's you know off the page, it's like, I, I think this is poetry because uh, you know, the making of the, of the drawings was sort of like making of a loose you know, dictionary that didn't have definitions and didn't really have clear organization. It was just scattered phrases and words. That was a dictionary. I think the collage aspect of it became the way for me to group those sorts of drawings together from being a dictionary to then being a writing process. And when that happened, um, I realized that the collage allowed me to sort of kind of solidify the making or solidify the making of the poem. And again, to your point, the ability to sort of come from something like Calvin and Hobbes, go through drawing, manifest as collage. Um, I think in order to have it be free from, from all of those kind of personal histories and free of my studio even and free of the histories like the personal histories and the sort of like the 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 very apparent history of Calvin Hobbes I needed to make it a poem and I needed to make it something that existed outside of all those things so the, the final step the final realization for this whole process isn't necessarily the collages it's actually the poems and the creation of a book of poetry because as that thing exists um, that is its own sort of thing. It's not tied to my studio. It's not tied to graphite. It's not tied to a personal memory of, of being a child or a love for a comic strip. It's not tied to a gift from my dad. And it's not tied to Bill Watterson's greatness or his um, brilliance as, as an author. It's not tied to any of that. It is its own thing. Um, and I think that's really important um, for how the, the poetry is understood. Um, so, and I find that it's interesting, but it's a little different than I think what we're talking about here, because I think what we're talking about here are the collage poems. And uh, so I think that's, which is a funny thing because the collage poems are what the show was. Like I couldn't, there's a weirdness in realizing that I couldn't necessarily show poems. <laughs> um, in a, uh, in, in, a, in a show, maybe I could have, but it's also a weird idea because I want it to be a book, mm -hmm. which is the addition of a book coming from a book feels like a really good full circle moment, you know? And the idea of um, my collage, the collages as my, of being a part of my studio and a part of my personal history and a part of uh, a, uh, a, the process of writing which is really what I think these collage poems are. They're evidence of a new process of writing, which I would not have um, gotten to if it weren't for collage, if it weren't for drawing, and if it weren't for um, those personal histories, if that makes sense. I know that was a little rambling. No, I think that does make sense. And I think, I mean, I think that's really interesting actually to think about the um, the works that we have in our collection at the Hirshhorn and that were on view in our museum are actually perhaps 
evidence of a, a sort of unfinished stage <laughs> on the way to writing a poem. You know, there's uh, something like they they are, um, yeah, there's somehow still uh, still in a sort of, yeah, un unfinished state, um, which is, yeah, which is interesting to think about in that in relation to, you know, how art can, um, can, can move from one medium to another and you can use one medium to do something ultimately in another medium. Um, and not to, not to like, I know we have to, we have to, I don't know how much time we got, but just to follow up on that, I think that's like one of the basic tenets of, of how I think about drawing as, as somebody that is makeshift, that is about working through. And it feels really good to, to be able to even think of it. Like, like looking back, it's like, oh, not exactly what it is. You know, I was, this is also a bit of an anecdote. I was, uh, I think it's called the Academy, the, the, the Academy uh, Museum out in LA. I'm, I'm, in, I'm in LA, by the way. <laughs> but I was just at that Academy Museum connected to, you know, LACMA. And I was looking through and there's this whole section on The Godfather. And I looked at this book that, uh, that Francis Ford Coppola sort of was, was going through. And it was, it was, the, it was the novel of, uh, of the person who wrote uh, The Godfather. And he had all these notes in it. And he had all these things and it was page after page after page of notes and marks and arrows and all, it was a working thing. And I think being able to see that working thing was kind of interesting. And when I think of uh, the collages, I think of them as a more specific, uh, much more complete um, project, but it's, it's still a working thing. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I mean, it's interesting too to think about um, like looking at the screen here where, and maybe if we go to the next slide, we can look at this image a little bit more closely that, um, that there is also a layer of, uh, of trying to understand yourself in a narrative that you don't see yourself in. That is that 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 you used this process to do. Like in some ways, this whole process originated as a way of trying to perhaps understand where you fit in this Calvin and Hobbes narrative. Um, and we see here this very early drawing that you did. Probably was this done before you even were before you began any of the small drawings from? Uh, if, or is this no? I guess this is a little later. Well, yeah, that was, this is at a time when I was making a bunch of these little, uh, this was while I was working on the all over ones where I just covered mm -hmm. the entire image. But there was also moments where, you know, if you have, you know, you got nine beat pencil and all you gotta do is, you know, scribble around his head and you can make an Afro Calvin, which right. is one of those things that, I don't know, it felt very liberating. It felt nice to be able to do that in a funky way, mm -hmm. but it's like, this is probably an example of the ways I would try to uh, interject myself or a history or just a new history or a new language or a new idea into um, the comic strip. Now, I think it doesn't, it sort of, it changes it the second you do that, it turns it into something else. But I think being able to, for a moment, especially in the making of this, see, oh yeah, what if Calvin had an Afro? What if, what if he was like on his way to school? And he just, you know, had a poof, had a, had a, had a, had a growth, growth spurt of really coarse, curly hair. <laughs> like, what would that look like? Uh, but it also just, it made me laugh. And it did give me some sort of, uh, some sort of comfort in a weird way. Well, and you speak in your letter to Bill Watterson about the fact that, I mean, you grew up, you know, out outside of Cleveland and yes. Bill Watterson is also located outside of Cleveland. You were very aware of that fact when you were a child. And so there was yeah. this sense that you were in the same kind of sphere as Calvin, right? A hundred percent. I think uh, when I was, you know, when I was a kid, I went to the school that I went to, I think it was very similar, you know, to, uh, you know, when I think of Calvin as a, as a character, as a kid, you know, I was a kid at the same time. And, you know, I knew that, uh, the Calvin Hobbes, you know, Cal Hobbes is a tiger because of, I, I, I believe, I don't I can't say this because I don't want to say this officially, but Hobbes is a tiger in the same way that a neighboring school, their mascot was a tiger. So that's why, that's why a lot of reasons, a lot of people believe that that's why Hobbes is a tiger. 
And I, my mascot in school was a lion because we were so close to that school. So it's, I think there are little moments like that growing up with it, knowing that it was made close enough and just the absolute brilliance of it being a story that I think a lot of the kids that grew up with me had the same sort of vibe and same sort of memories. But at the same time, they might not have had the same experience. And they might not have had the same experience of understanding themselves in relationship to Calvin Hobbes. They, they might have had a, a different way of understanding Calvin and Hobbes. But I think one, you know, one of the things I talk about in the essay is trying to figure out who Calvin was. Um, would we would would we have been friends? Would his would his parents would his parents have let me come over to hang out? And uh, it seems like they would, but then at the same time, there's a lot of kids in you know in in my neighborhood where we in in you know in elementary school and where their I don't think their parents would have wanted to to have their their children play with me. And I think there was just, there's a, there's a bit of a barrier there. So reading Calvin Hobbes as a kid, I'm like, I don't know. I like Calvin, I think he's hilarious, but I don't know if I'd be allowed to go play with him. Or I know we'd probably have the same, we'd probably both love the Cleveland Guardians, but I don't know if, I don't know if we'd be able to be in the same neighborhood. I don't know if we go to the same school kind of a thing, if that makes sense. Like that, those kind of narratives are, are very weird, but it's like, when I'm thinking, when you start working with a subject matter, it's such a personal experience. And uh, it definitely sets how the drawings come out and, and how I talk about, you know, which is, it's a very, I guess, for me to think about drawing, especially when we talk about the floor drawings, or especially when we talk about the earlier work you, you showed of people of Colorado. Those are, these are all different ways of understanding drawing. So when I talk about Calvin in, this, in these ways, I don't get to talk about drawing this way in, in almost any other format. So when we talk about the value of this work, it might not be the biggest, but it is certainly carrying with it a tremendous amount of meaning that I could never really get when I'm dealing with the floor drawings and vice versa. So I think one of the things I like to do is, is talk about one type of work in relationship to other type of work as a way to balance out and create a full landscape of all the possibilities of what drawing looks like, what, what uh, text drawing looks like. Um, but in this case, we're talking about a very specific source, a very specific um, history, which is uh, very meaningful to me. Yeah, and I, I, there are some questions that have come in in the chat, and I want oh, to go yeah. in just one yeah. second. But first, I do just want to show everybody a quick um, uh, glimpse at, if we go to the next slide, um, one part of this book, uh, which was created by oh, a right. good friend of yours, Carl Hendel, um, who made this amazing series of five drawings. We're seeing two of them right here um, that actually utilize, he has redrawn uh, different uh, characters and different frames from Sunday comics and, and he has given them a new story. So they are actually talking about your work and they are talking about, um, you know, the way you must have felt as a young boy growing up in Chicago as a young black boy, kind of really falling in love with this story of a young um, white boy and his imaginary tiger. And, um, and yeah. so if we go, actually, we can go through the, if we see the next slide, you see a sort of you see how this goes across many pages of the book, but on the la on the last slide here, um, <laughs> you can kind of see a close up of these characters kind of coming to the realization that they're all white, right? <laughs> that all of the yeah. characters in the Sunday comics. And I think, um, you know, in some ways what Carl has done here, you and he share a love of drawing and an investment in drawing. Um, and what he's yeah. done here is use the, the cartoon characters themselves to make the point, um, uh, to make a, a big point about kind of the position that you exist in vis-a-vis -vis this this work that you love very dearly absolutely i can't i can't uh speak uh highly enough about my conversation my relationship with carl and also uh our our conversations around the possibility of this of this particular visual essay that he uh that he produced it's just absolutely amazing and I think it's one of the most meaningful uh, things 
you know, it's, it's one of those, it's been one of, one of those meaningful conversations to be able to have this dialogue with an artist where you have, you know, you know, a mentor mentee relationship, uh, a love for drawing an intensity about drawing, and also just the ability to sort of be honest and open about sorts of uh, a wide range of topics. And so, you know, the fact that Carl was able to basically from our many conversations and emails come up with this, uh, it is really, really special, and I'm really grateful for it. Um, and I, I know we don't have a lot of time, but so I just wanted to really quickly. I just want to give. I just want to say a huge, huge thank you to to Carl. A massive thank you to you, Betsy, for your essay and all your support for the past five years. We've been working six years, almost. We've been working on this. Everyone at the Hirshhorn, Melissa Chu, of course, and definitely. Uh, I want to give a quick shout out to uh, the Aster Gates. Who's, who wrote an, an absolutely unbelievable, very sharp, um, very honest essay, uh, which kind of, I'm still kind of reeling over, but he also provided a lot of project, a, a lot of support for this particular project. So I wanna say, uh, if he's watching, uh, cheers to you, I love you T. Uh, but also just in terms of, you know, I just, I'm really grateful for how this project turned out. And I'm really grateful for all the work, including everybody at Moose, Moose uh, Publishing as well. But uh, I know you, we wanted to get to some Q and A's. Is that correct? Yes. So um, uh, there's one here from Grace uh, who says, thank you for the great conversation. I'm very interested in what Tony was talking about regarding the final poetry book as being a completely separate autonomous book from the poetry collages. I wonder if you could talk more about what he sees as the relationship between materiality and language specifically in regards to the text of the final poetry book and how it relates to the text back in, uh, relate the text, wait a minute, how the text relates back to its material origins. There we go. Does that help? A hundred percent. It does. I think, um, I think that the, the, the book that was produced at the end, uh, well, so not to be I, confused. I actually have your right. sort of chat books. You made these poetry. Yes. Chat so books. I made, what are you calling them? I'm calling them a chat book. Is that the right term? I think that's what they call like these sorts of poetry books. I could be wrong. No, yeah, absolutely. Whatever that is, <laughs> absolutely. That's what that is. It's a, uh, it's a little paperback book. And also shout out to Candor Arts who helped me produce that with a crazy turnaround back in 2018. Uh, Candor Arts was an incredible, incredible uh, Chicago-based publication uh, spot. But we, that, the, the production of that particular book was everything that needed to happen because again, I wanted to find a way to forget about drawing, forget about collage, forget about, you know, uh, even Calvin and Hobbes, forget about personal histories. I wanted that to stand alone as writing. So that creating it into a book allowed me to sort of think of it as a thing that can just be accepted as such, as free language, or as something that is easily accessible, um, which is a different thing than the collages. And because um, I think the collages carry all that weight. So I think the, the ability to create a book of poetry uh, was ultimately the most liberating gesture. It was the most liberating thing I could do because I didn't necessarily, when I, when I present that book of poetry, everything that happened before is just part of the writing process, which is where we're sitting right now. We're talking about the writing process, but that book of poetry is in and of itself the thing. Now, it took a lot to do it. It's weird that I think the writing process might take cutting and drawing and, and gluing and, and, and framing and all these things. Uh, but that's what the writing process is. And that's what these objects are. So the separation between the two is absolutely essential. And the project isn't complete without that book of poetry. Um, so what you think what we're working on? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I, I think I talked over you. No, go ahead. Uh, we had another question that was similar from David. Uh, when you showed the final multi-frame collage poem, you also displayed a plain text version extracting the text from each frame. I was wondering if when the work was displayed on the walls, you also had the plain text version available or took other steps to make the text more readable, um, same for in the book. Right, I think what we did is to make the book of poetry. So yeah, we, we showed had the... this available in the space. Right. 
So that, that was a way to understand the words. But the collages were about much more than the words, much more than the poems. That's why it's about a writing process. And I think that, I mean, that's why it's about collage and drawing. Um, that's what we put on display. And that's, that's what the focus of the, the, uh, the exhibition was. Yeah. Um, and I think, you know, that's always been kind of very important. And even in this publication um, that we have just made, it was important to us that we didn't only have the, um, the collages, but we also, I don't know if everybody can see that, we also represented the poetry um, in its uh, just language text-based form. So we do that across yeah. from the collages when we reproduce them in the plate section of the book. Um, that felt okay. like it was a critical element of all of this. It was perfect. And like I said, shout out to Moose and the design team for sort of, cause I can't think of ways to sort of do that. You know, cause I, cause I can you know, the poems and the collages are kind of separate, but I think it's really important to have that visual balance for when we're creating a book like this for work that kind of functions on many levels. It's, it's, it's really helpful to have those kinds of, um, those kinds of presentations. Mm -hmm. um, Definitely. Um, we have a question from Andrew, um, who asks, how did you engage with the existential themes of Calvin and Hobbes in your work? <laughs> I still deal with them all the time. I think what's beautiful about the, 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 the uh, original Calvin and Hobbes is that it always kind of works. It always kind of has that, that energy. I think um, personally, when I was, when I read it, when I consume Calvin and Hobbes as a, as a, as a, as a viewer or as a reader, I enjoy it just like anybody else. But when I'm talking about the creation of the small drawings and the collages, I think things get um, much more playful, much more dark, much more serious and a little more absurd. And I think, again, it was about being able to come from a place of, as we've talked about before, uh, Betsy, as we've talked about before, coming from a place of say order or, um, or of sense and going to nonsense, but then from nonsense going to some other form of new sense or logic or writing or expression. And um, so for me, I think it was really important to create a range of attitudes um, and approach, approach the paper. And when I say paper, I mean Calvin and Hobbes pages. It was really important to approach the paper with a wide range of, uh, of energy and intensity and passivity and specific goals and also no goals at all. I needed to sort of occupy several different places so I could make a drawing from the pages, if that makes sense. Yeah, so sometimes I, I would pay attention and sometimes I could care less. <laughs> I mean, it's interesting to think of the paper as uh, an active participant in the creation of this poem. Right? <laughs> like yeah. there is something like, like the paper and the materials and all of these other elements, they're creating it with you, right? Absolutely. They're collaborators. And I think that happens a lot in artist studios. You know, I, it's, it's sort of like, there's always something you react to. I think that's why if you ever go to an artist studio, there's so much stuff going on. They seem a little off balance because there's always something talking to them. There's always something that they're thinking about over there that they can't quite, they can't quite figure out yet. And I think uh, there, there's that constant going back and forth and figuring out how do I want to respond to this? And a lot of times it's color, sometimes it's material and sometimes it's paper. And I think that, that that's something that I think artists do a lot, which is, uh, I think that's what makes it a lot of fun. <laughs> And just a fun question here at the end, what are you reading these days? Do you take inspiration from books or poetry to make any of your works? Oh my gosh, what am I reading these <laughs> days? <laughs> no, I, I, in the weird sense, I think I'm reading a lot. I, I, I still read Calvin Hobbes quite a bit. And <laughs> I, I comb through it um, in, a weird, in a weird way. I've been thinking about uh, trying to understand Calvin Hobbes in a couple different languages because it's been translated into a few different books. Oh, that's so, interesting. Yeah, it's, it's been translated into a few different languages. Mm -hmm. So um, it's kind of, uh, it's funny to kind of work my way through it. Um, like a comic I may recognize with language that I don't is a really, is a really funny, funny thing. But no, what am I reading? I don't want to tell anybody what I'm reading. I'm reading a couple of that's things. That's fair. But 
I don't want to. I don't want to get into it. But I I like what I'm reading. <laughs> yeah, fair. <laughs> okay, well, I think that's a good point to end up. And you know, there's got to be some mystery, right? <laughs> I know, I know. I think <laughs> Who knows what the next body of work could be? <laughs> I know. <laughs> Um, well, thank you so much, Tony. It's, um, you know, it's, you. Such, it's always such a pleasure to talk with you. You are one of my favorite humans. Um, your um, warmth and generosity always shows through in everything you do. Um, and, uh, it, it, you know, your work is uh, so compelling and so strong. So I appreciate you, appreciate you being here with us. Thanks to the audience. Thanks for uh, sticking with us late at night here. <laughs> we appreciate you for being here and for being interested. Um, there was a message dropped in the chat. If you're interested in purchasing this book, um, we are very kind of proud of this creation. <laughs> it's something that we feel uh, really um it was a it was a labor of love by everyone involved. Um, again, thanks to Theoster Gates for all of his very generous support. Um, thanks tonight to Amy Barr and Frankie um, Lamb from our public programs and visitor experience teams. They um, make all of this happen. Um, and also thanks for our ASL interpretation from Julie and closed captioning from Joy. Um, you know, you you both are the best and you help us re reach an even wider audience. So- uh, Thank you, Julie and Joy. Yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> we appreciate you all and hope you tune into the next Hirshhorn program. Good night. Thank you guys. Bye-bye. Bye, Tony.